said, leaders of the new school, started with Buster Rhymes, Charlie Brown, Cut Monica to Milo, we from Uniondale, the town of Hempstead, you know what I'm saying? And um, came up under Public Enemy, you know what I'm saying? Chuck D is the guy who named our group, he gave Buster Rhymes his name, gave Charlie Brown his name, and he was like a professor to us, so we definitely have a, you know what I'm saying, a root connection to that whole PE camp, you know what I'm saying? Then we came up under, you know, came together with Tribe Core Quest, Native Tongues, De La Soul, you know what I'm saying? And we connected and vibe, so you know, we did records, we toured, toured with all the great 90 golden era hip hop groups, you know what I'm saying? Um, from everybody, major label deals, you know, you know it's all but we was doing free shows before the major label deal, we was grinding, you know right. what I'm saying? It, it took us five, six years, you know, I deal with a lot of cats and I'm telling them like, you know, you gotta have a plan in, in, in years. It ain't a couple months, a couple weeks. You gotta plan for years. Right. It's just like, you know, buying a house or anything. 30, 30 year old, you gotta, you gotta have a full plan and map it out and, and, and put it to work. All right, bet. So now we're gonna pass the mic off to IU. Go ahead and introduce yourself, brother, lay it on. Granddaddy IU, you know what I'm saying? Hempstead on Island. I came up under Biz Marquis and um, I was signed up for chilling. You know what I'm saying? I had something new, Sugar Free, or my first album, whatever, whatever, whatever. Ghost Roll for um, Roxanne Chante, Ghost Roll for Bismarck, produced for KRS, um, Ice-T, um, Helter Skelter, um, did joints for Big L, Jay-Z, Biggie, um, whatever, man. I, I, just, I just did shit. I, 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 I got signed in 1989. Yeah, and I'm still high right now, nigga. That's 26, 25 years, whatever. That's what I'm talking about. That's what it is. That's what's up. So we'll go ahead and introduce yourself, sis. My name is Shanika Sanders. I am journalist for This Is 50, JackDonald.com, um, and like a billion and one other sites, and soon to be on air personality and host of Miss Independent Show on 101 The Heat in Phoenix, Arizona. There it is. We're gonna pass over the workout. I got you, brother. There you go. It's long. It's long. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, I rise to give praise to Allah, and give honors to his holy prophet, Noble Joali, and I give honors to all those here convened. My name is Lord Merck Ill. I am Angel and Training Number One from Harlem, New York. And what I do is I'm an educator in the streets of Harlem, Philadelphia, Newark, Chicago, and the city near you. And I teach nationality, government principles, order, mathematics, English proficiency, Spanish, and I teach those things that are necessary to make our people, the Asiatics of North America who have lost their nationality, true American citizens, better people, and all in all I teach that we are all one. So I hope that any of the information that I dispense today will be of a benefit to you. Peace and love. That's peace. How you doing everybody? My name is Digital. Um, I wear many hats in this industry. Uh, first and foremost, um, I do a show at WUSB Stony Brook 90.1 FM. It's called Battles on Radio. Um, as of today, as a matter of fact, I, I just became the hip hop director at WUSB in Stony Brook. So that, that's, a, that's major for me. Congrats, um, brother. Congrats thank you. on the record. Uh, I also manage um, two underground artists, Black Poet and Illa G. Um, I perform with the legendary Tiski Valley. I'm also a mobile DJ, and I'm also the host of In the Streets TV, which comes on public access with my partner, Big H. Um, that's about it. There it is. So everybody, once again, give a round of applause to the panelists. Well, what I've done here, and once again, the reason that um, these particular people are sitting on the panel um, now that you know what validates them to say, you know, and answer some of the questions we're going to ask, the, big, the biggest thing and the most important thing to me is that the information that people get is true. Um, I don't have to agree with everything that everyone says, but when somebody says something that's true and they're willing to stand on it and demonstrate it, not just say it, and they live it, it's a different ball game. As you can see, my brother got the skateboard here with his name on it. So when we talk about entrepreneurialism, we talking about going out there and making changes in the community, um, you know, this panel demonstrates that, and that's why we sitting here right now. So with that said, we're gonna get into these couple of questions. And uh, the first question is for Dinko D, um, and it's for Granddaddy IU. Um, and, and I wanna make one more sidebar. 
that, the, that this particular discussion that we have in is entitled politics and music and where they merge. So the questions that I'm asking are going to deal with that particular subject matter um, in, in, in some respects. So Dinko D, if you can, and, and for Granddaddy IU, can you explain what the transition from No Deal does, uh, you know, from No Deal to having a deal mentally does to a person? Like, if you can recall what happened when the, if you can remember the minute you got that deal, did you notice a personality change? What does that do to an artist? Um, we can start with Dinko D. Well, deal or no deal, I mean, no deal is, um, that's the grassroots circuit, man. You know what I'm saying? That's the, that's the formulation of, of your ideas, personalities, and putting them together, you know? That's the grind, man. That's, that's probably the, the best part and best times of it, you know what I'm saying? Because once you get a deal, you know what I'm saying? You're dealing with a whole nother group of people who are gonna control your personalities, control your music, and all of that. And it's, it's, it's better to be independent, you know what I'm saying, right now in this day and age, you know? They kind of stopped that game because they seen a lot of brothers were doing real good on the independent scene, if you notice. And they, and they, and they made it one, one conglomerate right now. You know, There's only a couple of people putting out deals. It's like three major labels right now. You know what I'm saying? With a couple. So, it's, it's deal is it's, it's just more money. It's just money and, and more power controlling your product. Right. Do you think it does something to an artist mentally, though? Do you think there's a point where they go from like, I'm nobody and I'm striving to do it and I'm trying to get on to like, I'm that dude now. Cause we see that happen to so many brothers where, you know, the people around them go, oh, he think he on now. And it's like, you can't even come back to the hood. But when you do, you in less better circumstances than when you was on. So now it's like, do you think it does something to the mindset of people to get this deal? Um, not really. Like I said, I mean, I've always talked about, I think that your, your personality is just emphasized with more money. So, you know, it's like the inner core will come out. You know what I'm saying? When you come out as an artist on a big label, you're just a bigger form of what you really were on a quiet level. You know what I'm saying? You get to, you get to be, you get to express that personality on a bigger scale and, and it comes out. So it's, it's, really, it's, really no, um, it's really no difference. You know, you get more money to buy more, more things and, and look more you know, flashy or and pretty or whatever, but you're the same person. You're the same person, and it's gonna show. Right. So same question for Ayu. How you, do, you, do you feel a deal mentally does something to artists, or do you think it's, it's you know, something that's benign and, and you know, neutral? Nowadays, I think definitely it, it does something to these young casts because, like, they, before they get the deal, they one way, like, you, you know what I'm saying, you see niggas now to get a deal, now they dressing like homos and shit like that. Niggas wear right. tight shit and all this other funny style shit. Niggas dressing like hips, hipsters and it's all this stuff. Yeah, all, all, all this other funny style shit that they, before that, you wasn't in the hood like that, my nigga told me. <laughs> <laughs> Why you get like that now? Like, for real, like, bro. Clap for it. Don't be afraid to clap. That's you right. you love clap for it, so the people can know you appreciate it. Well, like for me, when I when I got the deal, like I was, you know, what I'm saying not to say whatever. When I came straight off the street, I, I like it just it, it kind of like fell in my lap with the with the Bismarck shit. So it just happened. So I didn't have no preparation or none of that shit. I didn't know nothing. They didn't tell me nothing about how the industry works or nothing. So I got on. I'm bringing all my niggas. Them niggas is wild. They tan shit up and all that shit is reflecting, reflecting on me. You know what I'm saying? My entourage, you know what I'm saying? They stealing shit. They fight, start fights and all kind of wild shit. You not knowing when they tear some shit up, now they, the club don't want you back. You know what I'm saying? Nah, we ain't fucking with that nigga no more. You know what I'm saying? Or different different executives see you in a certain light. Like, nah, we, we can't work with him because, you know what I'm saying? The nigga wild or his crew is wild. And, you want to win, you want to win, why? Shit ain't, you know what I'm saying? Shit ain't clicking for you, shit ain't happening for you because right. nigga don't want to fuck with you because you, you now be like, yeah, like you said, you blacklisted now. And so if, you, if you're if not aware of that shit, you wondering what the fuck happened. You know what I mean? And okay. so it, and if you're young and they, they don't teach you that, you go and come, you, you come and show up the street, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Nine times out of ten. Yeah, you can add on. Um, Feel free to add on. Um, I think, like, personally, like, 
with my two pages, don't quote me on this, but um, I also think like with the deal, it's like the more money that you make, it's like the less humility you get. And like their ego gets so far in the clouds, it's like, and they just need to learn how to be humble because the same people, the people that you meet up are the same people that you're gonna meet back down. Right. So and they gotta learn to humble themselves more. Right. You don't know anything could happen. They could snatch that deal right from under your feet. And uh, you know something too, I wanna add on to that point real quick. Uh, something that I noticed is that a lot of artists take for granted how many employees are in the record uh, record label. Yes. A lot of artists that, and I say this to all the artists here, and the creative people, if you're a creative person, stop holding artists in high regard for no reason. Because at the end of the day, there's 200 executives in the building, there's 200 people in the building, 180 people that are pushing the record platinum, but we giving all the glory to the artists. So at the end of the day, just to be honest, just be like, well, he signed a Def Jam. How many people work there? Good. And it's a good question. I mean, it's like, you know how many people work at Walmart. You, can, you know what I'm saying? Like, you can see hundreds of people at the cash register, but so that's the unseen industry is that, you know, I've been in the, this brother right here has been with me from the beginning. Big Cop tell you, we seen, you know, we seen it from the inside, the outside, and the other side. And there's, there's employees that do this nationally. So you talk about in some cases, right, with major labels, you might have an office in New York, you might have an office in LA, and you might have an office in Cali, and you might, you know, have 50 employees here, 70 in New York, and these are the people that are calling and requesting the record having that telemarketing set up and they coming in from four to eight to call and request the record. So we gotta stop giving artists to that point. I say uh, those that don't deserve it. Not saying that um, like, you know, the, that they don't make good music. Yes, they do. But however, that is, that success can't be attributed to them individually. It puts them in an icon. Yeah, yeah, we gonna get there. So the next question we gonna direct that to Brother Lord Merkel, um, if you wanna pass him the mic. Lord Mark L, um, and it seems, it's going to seem like a little jump from that to this, but I'm going to bring it all together, um, you know, towards the end. Something that, um, you know, has been going on lately with the, 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 the lady that claimed she was black from the, uh, what's the organization? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I always give these people names because the story kind of goes so quick. So with that, um, is, the, is the true concept of nationality addressed enough in, in regular media, one, and in the content that's being created and given to our people is the concept of nationality something that you feel is being stressed enough and if, if not give us some idea how we can um, begin to engage the conversation for those that don't know what nationality is or how it works and what it's really about it's on. It's on. I would like to start with the main thing that really acknowledge isn't whether something is being stressed enough, but whether or not we are stressing the subject matter. You see there, when we outside and we breathing, you know, we in the atmosphere, we're not stressing the oxygen over all the other elements in the periodic table when we breathe in. We just breathe in. And so nationality is always being expressed all around us. You know, we just, we just had Juve go on. I'm saying everybody who in the hood with you, black power, and black unity, and black pride, until Juve comes around. It's like, nah, I'm Antigua. I'm Jamaican. I'm Trinidad. What? I'm Trinidad today? What? You know, my grandfather's half Puerto Rican. B, what are you talking about? And it's like, that's cool, but now we have 60 different flags in one place, and everybody looks the same. <laughs> wow. <laughs> It's not so much that nationality isn't being expressed as much as there's a there's a large group, an aggregate of people who aren't aware of what it is that they're seeing. They can't acknowledge it as such, and therefore they can't you know execute any of the capacities nor reap any of the benefits. Right. So so to refine what I'm asking you a little more, so maybe it can help you go in a little more. Um, should nationality be a concept that's taught to children? And, and should that be something that's introduced to them at a young age for those that are here and for those that listen and have children? And you know, once they go to your site and they go to your channel and they start delving into this and they learn, 
should this be something that should be taught to children? And would you advise people to start giving your, your children that national sense of national nationality? This is something that's taught to children. All children okay. know this automatically. They're taught this at home. Is that the, the people, the only people who don't acknowledge this are the people who refer to themselves as Negroes, Blacks, Colors, African Americans, ETC. It is the Moors who are referred to as Negroes and Blacks who don't know anything about nationality but still are teaching their children portions of it. So, like for example, nationality is expressed in the mediums where we are, just like in the music that we create. We always hear, we always hearing about nationality. You remember when Biddy was talking about, you know, the Amulis? Mm -hmm. You know, he was he was telling you about the the, the conflicts that the Asiatics or the so-called Negroes was having with it, Italians in Brooklyn at that time. So nationality is always being expressed to our children. It's just now we as so-called blacks, so-called Latinos, so-called Hispanics, labels that are not nationalities, need to recognize and acknowledge what it is by actually going into the dictionary, finding out what the definition of the various words we're using is, and then realize, hey, you know, when we're telling our children, hey, you know what? When you see Jesus and you see Ramon and Cesar, you know what I'm saying? And you over here trying to make fun of your name because it's Malik or it's Rahman, you know what I'm saying? You have a name that's yours. You know, you explain to them, we the same people, we just speak different languages. And then I have somebody really like, think like, when I was in, and you know, going back to as a child, when I was a child, I was raised Puerto Rican. I'm thinking I'm Puerto Rican, I'm thinking that's a people, not a place. And I know Puerto Rico's a place, not a people now. But back then, you know, I'm dark skin, I speak my language, you know. Some people, they didn't know, said a few things. Oh, you mean I get the money to eat that? It's like, yeah, what happened? And it turns out, oh, you see, you were treating me as an enemy. You were starting to scheme on me. You wanted to do some harm to me. Now you understand that the only difference that we have was a language. Now we could work together. Right. Good now we could do that as children. Imagine what we could accomplish as adults. True indeed. Give it up for that. Give it up for that. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanna, uh, I wanna swing it over to Digital, DJ Digital, real quick, and something, and something that, like I said, once, once we get towards the end of the discussion, you're gonna see why all of these questions are relevant. Um, because what I want people to walk away from this with, the listeners to walk away with, is start to question some of the ideas. So. Digital, I want to know from you, uh, how has terrestrial radio been affected by satellite radio and internet radio? What's been the effects you being at an FM radio station? What have you noticed has been the, the fall off or the pickup or, you know, is, what's been going, what have you seen change? And, oh, you know, I'm on the radio because I remember it was a big deal to hear yourself on the radio. It was like, I'm on the radio, it was over. I remember my first time, early 90s, I heard my, my stuff on I-97, and it was like, oh, oh, oh. You know, like, wow, it's, it's on. So it's not like that no more. It's, it's really not like that. So how has, you know, satellite and the new radio formats affected that, that entire format of FM and what we held as radio? Well, first of all, satellite and internet radio gives you more of an option. Uh, a more variety of music that you hear. Terrestrial radio has definitely fallen off. Uh, it, it's to the point now where if, if you listen to the commercial radio stations, you would think that there's only 10 artists because you hear the same songs over and over and over and the same artists over and over and over. You know, I had a dream that uh, a gentleman said to me, I'm down in Florida, and a gentleman said to me, listen, man, I got a million dollars for you. If you can just get back to New York, but the only way you can get back to New York is if you listen to a radio and let the music guide you home, being that New York has its own sound. Okay? I was lost. I was lost. Why? Because all the radio stations are playing the same music. And, you know, I, I have some paperwork here in front of me, and I'm not ashamed to pull it out because I couldn't remember all of these numbers, but it's, it's really an illusion of choice. Um, there's 1,500 newspapers, 1,100 magazines, 9,000 radio stations, 1,500 TV stations, 2,400 publishers, and it's only owned by six corporations and 272 executives. 
So you're going to hear the same thing as long as they own the station. 90% of what 277 million people listen to, see, and hear are controlled by these six corporations. Okay. Now, as far as... What, the, what are the six corporations? The six corporations <laughs> are General Electric, wow. News Corp, yeah. Disney, Gross. Viacom, Gross. Time Warner, and CBS. Yep. Now, now, right here, I want to enter the name for the record. On and for the record. Somebody that, anybody that makes music, right, and I want y'all to pay attention to this because now I'm going to show y'all where nationality and the music cross their lines. So, out of those companies he named, there's a man by the name of Sumner Redstone. Look up that name. Sumner, S-U-M-N-E-R, Redstone. His original name was Sumner Rothstein. Now, he understands nationality because he went from Rothstein to Redstone, which is German for, so he knew what he was. So my point is, is for him to be able to own VH1, MTV, and all these other, when you look up, when you look this up and you find out that he owns a lot of what he just said, this one particular person privately owned, and he holds all this stock of him and his family, and they decide, right, and there's nothing wrong with being Jewish, but these German so-called Jews, which is a whole other, you know, my brother Merkella going on me for using the term, but we're going we're gonna to leave it alone. But the so-called Jew who owns this, these stations. So what is the agenda for young so-called African-American, so-called black people, really who are Moors, right? What's the, how can a Jew, a Jewish person from Germany, create or teach or offer or identify with the experience of these people in their current you know, situation. It's impossible. You can't possibly put up content in that situation that's going to be reflective of helping these people. You just, you, you can't do it. What, how? Your, your family history doesn't show that you're capable of doing that. So I just wanted to add that point and that name on it for the record. Can I add um, one more thing? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. With radio, commercial radio being the way that it is now, I mean, you know, when I was growing up, for example, you had a larger variety of music. You know, you would hear dance hall, you would hear reggae, you would hear slow jams, you would hear hip hop, you would hear go go music, all in the same day. All right, but it, it, it's just it's it's to the point now where when you can turn to WBLI and then turn to WBLS and you hear the same song, the same pop song. It's a problem. It's definitely a problem. Okay, thank you. So we're going to direct this next question to the sister, Shamika Sanders. Um, I want to know from you, how powerful is PR and, you know, internet promotions? How, how, how important is it for artists to come to you, look you up online, and get their PR from you because you're going to get it done right? But how important is that public relations or that promotions, how important is that in this digital environment to have somebody who knows how to do that and do it well and, and show that they can do it and do it well? How important is that? Well, I think that um, with PR, if an artist is looking to be known, PR has the reach that they can't get. You know, if you want your song on like internet radio or anything like that, we can do that. You know, like you want promotions, you want online promotions, we can do that. And that's basically basically just like the stepping stone of how to get an artist started on, you know, like popularity, quote unquote. Right. So would it be enough these days for artists to open a Facebook page, let's say, have a Twitter account, and then handle it themselves? And then really, because this is what I run into. I run into artists that may have a couple of hundred followers on Facebook, a couple of thousand followers on Twitter, whether they paid the 50 bucks or not to get to add the followers, and then they show up and they do this. I'm popping online. You got to pay me to perform. Now, when you get them into the venue, right, it's crickets. Nobody came, but you got 10,000 followers on Twitter, your Facebook, you're on Facebook all day, but it was crickets at the live show, which was unacceptable, you know, 20 years ago. That was unacceptable. You were booty, bless, bless. 
you a, you a booty for that. You a, you, know, you couldn't even do that. Like you know what I'm saying. So so is it is it something that you would ex, ex, you know tell people to do themselves or hire out for? Would they be better off trying to do their own PR or like you might want to get a they're, firm? They're better off hiring out. Right. They're better off. And why would you say that? Why would you say that? Um. I I'm not even going to say guess because, um, like I said before, like we have that reach. Like if you're looking to be on Vivo, like we can do that and just bring your following up from like a thousand to ten thousand or more. And it's organic. These are not, yes, you know, not, not, not the eggs. eggs. What I call eggs, electronically generated groupies. <laughs> so when you see these people and you, you book them for a show and it's like, you know, 37 people came, but they got 200,000 followers, it's, and they all those little eggs you see on Twitter, and that's, that's what we call them. That's absurd. Little eggs. That yeah. is so absurd. Like, right. I've never heard numbers like that before, right. and it's coming from an artist that I barely know. Wow. <laughs> so so this next question is for uh, Dinko and Granddaddy IU. Uh, with the whole with the whole ghostwriting thing, uh, since somebody should somebody be frowned upon in hip hop at this point for claiming to be an MC? This is an intricate question. They claim to be an MC and they stand on the MC square, but they have a ghostwriter. Is that acceptable? If yes, why do you feel that way? And if no, why do you feel that way? I mean, definitely not. I mean, we we um we all take from something. You know, we all learn nursery rhymes. We say nursery rhymes in our rhymes. You know what I'm saying? We didn't write the nursery rhymes, but we use them. You know, it's 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 about this publishing. There's different means. There's an art form of the MC. You where you supposed to be. If you gonna battle somebody, you definitely need to be standing alone and not have a ghostwriter. But if you are artist just making music for people to hear, it's it's right. If you want to use a good writer, use a good writer. You know what I'm saying? You don't make your own beats. You know what I'm saying? You somebody's producing your beats. Some people are good at certain things. Some people are not. But if you, if you got good people in your corner, that's a good writer, make a good song, let them use it. You know, you can use that talent. When I was in a group, you know, we wrote each other parts and rhymes that we set together, you know what I'm saying? Right, that was my next question. Glad so, you know, like when we first started, Buster wasn't the greatest writer in the world. You know what I'm saying? We helped him write some of his rhymes. But as he grew and professed, you know what I'm saying? He, he got nasty. So that's, you know, there's a feel for that. If you want to be a battle MC, don't don't have people write your rhymes. You know what I'm saying? That's just not. There's different genres of music for you to be in where you could um you could be that MC or you could just be that artist. Right, I got you. Me, myself, if you if you claim to be an MC, you gotta write your own shit absolutely all day all day. <laughs> I know Drake is popular and all the rest of that shit, more power to him. But to see him on a Sprite fucking campaign with Nas and Rock him, and this man don't even write his own shit, come on, son, that shit is noise.